Good afternoon. I hope you're doing well. Let's open our Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 17. And our text today will be verses 6 through 19. And the Bible says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest taken them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And verse 19 says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Let's pray that God will bless this time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to be able to study your word once again. Now, Lord, I ask you, please, Bless us stand together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I heard this story about a dad who took his son one day to town because he needed to run some errands. And when lunchtime came, they went into this family diner, sat down, ordered their lunch. And when the waitress came back with the food, the dad looked around and noticed that the place was pretty packed. Being a little embarrassed to pray out loud, he told his son, Son, we'll just have a silent prayer. And they both closed their eyes. And the dad got through his prayer first. But notice that his son was taking an unusually long time praying. And after a while, he finally opened his eyes and the dad said, What in the world were you praying about that took you so long? And with the innocence of a child, the little boy said, How am I supposed to know? It was a silent prayer. <laughs> Can I tell you something? When you pray, don't let your prayer be a silent prayer. Make sure you say something. Make sure that you talk to the Father. We're studying Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, and his prayer was anything but silent. John, and I'm pretty sure that the other disciples were able to hear his prayer because John would write this prayer many, many years later. Now, before he prays for them, Jesus mentions the reasons why these men were true disciples. What makes someone a true disciple? Jesus tells us here three very important things that describe a true disciple or a follower of Christ. And that was true of these disciples 
uh, the, the 11 that were in the upper room, and it's also true for the followers of Jesus today. Let's look at these three um, characteristics of a true disciple of Christ. Then we're going to look at the actual prayer, at the actual requests that Jesus makes to the Father. What makes someone a true disciple? Well, in the first place, Jesus says that they knew the name of the Father. They knew the name of the Father. Look at verse 6. Jesus said, I have manifested thy name, thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. So they knew the name of the Father. Now, this does not refer to a specific name such as Elohim or Adonai or Yahweh. That is not what Jesus means here. Basically what he says here, what he means is that he had taught them about the character and the nature of God. Not a specific name. Uh, look at Psalm 113 in verse 1. Um, the psalmist said, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise, listen, the name of the Lord. So that phrase, the name of the Lord, does not refer to a specific name. In fact, the Jews did not like mentioning the name of God like we do today. They were very careful not to use the actual name of God or the titles that he is given. They would just use different titles such as uh, the Lord of hosts or things like that, titles like that, because they were very concerned that they were going to break the second commandment with commandment which says specifically not to take the name of the Lord in vain. And so they were very careful not to mention the name of God. Okay, so again, when Jesus says that he taught his disciples the name of God, he's not talking about a specific name, but rather that he was teaching them the nature and the character of God. In other words, he was teaching them who the Father was, so that they could have a better understanding of the Father. And by the way, it is also our job and our responsibility as Christians today to help people understand who God is, because there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about who God is, about who the Father is. People out there do not know and if you and I know the Father, it is our responsibility to teach them. All right. So what makes then someone a true follower of Christ? Jesus is telling us here three very important things. And the first one that he says is that they know the name of the Father. The second thing that Jesus says that makes someone a true follower of Jesus. And now remember that these 11 men that were in the upper room, Jesus is about to pray for them specifically, those 11 people. And that's what we're going to be um, studying in these verses right now. What gave them that privilege to be there at this particular moment and to have Jesus pray for them at this very moment? What gave them that privilege? And it is what we are learning here. The very reason why they're there is because of these three things, okay? And the first thing that Jesus says is, they know the name of the Father. The second thing, again, that gave them this privilege, the second thing that makes them true disciples, and by the way, this is also true for you and for me today. If we are true disciples and true followers of Jesus Christ, this also applies to you and me. Because if you're a disciple, a follower of Jesus today, you know 
the name of the Father. In other words, you know who God is. That's the first thing. The second thing that Jesus says is that they knew that Jesus was the Son of God. In other words, they did not believe that Jesus was just a carpenter, just some guy. Uh, they did not believe that he was just a great teacher. He was not just uh, some prophet. No, they knew and believed that Jesus was the very Son of God. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15 says, He saith unto them, this is Jesus asking them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter, in verse 16, answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so there, the Bible tells us that they knew and believed that Jesus was not just some great teacher. No, they actually believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And if you are a Christian today, this is what you believe, right? The third thing that Jesus mentions here is that they received the word of God. They received, look, look at verse 8. He said, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have, notice, received them. So Jesus gave and they received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have there it is again believed that thou didst send me so they heard the words but not only did they hear the words but they believed the words that's what Jesus is saying that they received the words and believe them and that is important because when you receive God's word that is what makes you a true follower of Christ John chapter 6 in verse 68 then Simon Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go thou has the words there it is the words of eternal life this is what Simon Peter believed and this is what the disciples, the true disciples, all of them except, of course, Judas. Judas is no longer here in this group. He has left the building. And so now only the 11 true disciples remain. And these 11 true disciples are the ones who receive the word of God and believe the word of God. And that's what makes them true followers of Christ and again how do you know that you are a true follower of God today well you have to know the father you have to know that Jesus is the son of God okay and you have to have received the words of God and believe them that's what makes you a true disciple today now notice verse 9 verse 9 is very interesting because it says there I pray not for the world now this does not mean that you and I cannot pray for unbelievers Jesus here was just focused um, at, at this very time Jesus is just focused on praying for the disciples that's all that means because I know that somebody might read this and get the wrong impression and say aha uh -huh, look we're not supposed to pray for unbelievers but that is not what this means we can pray for unbelievers we can pray for their salvation you know we can pray for the for our politicians we can pray for our government um, officials we can pray for our presidents that God would give them wisdom right to govern our country to create um, laws that are actually helpful to our nation and to us yes we can pray for them we can pray for our communities we can pray for our neighbors that are not saved 
that is i believe our responsibility so jesus is not saying to us here look don't pray for unbelievers that is not what he's saying okay um so i think that's important to understand jesus prayed for his disciples we see here and listen today jesus prays for you and for me because we are also disciples we are followers of jesus christ and today he continues to pray and to make intercession for you and for me uh, someone might say oh you know no one cares about me no one really uh, prays for me i don't have anybody to pray for me listen that is not true jesus prays for you when he sees that you're struggling when he sees that you need some help jesus is there helping you okay he's there interceding for you he is there praying for you that's what the bible teaches us romans chapter 8 and verse 34 tells us the following who is he that condemneth it is christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of god listen who also maketh intercession for us jesus christ makes intercession for you and for me today just like he did for those disciples two thousand years ago he's doing the very same thing today and also in first john chapter 2 in verse 1 the bible says my little children these things write i unto you that ye say not and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So don't believe that no one cares about you and that no one prays for you. That is simply not the case. Jesus Christ prays for you. And I think that is a great thing to know. All right. And so, again, the first thing that Jesus tells us here is what these disciples knew their privileges and the very reason why jesus is praying for them it's because they knew the name of the father they knew that jesus was the son of god and they received the word of god now let's look at the prayer this high priestly prayer of jesus he is going to make basically two uh, requests to the Father. Two very important requests, and that's what we're going to look at. Let's look at the first request that he makes to the Father. The first request is for their protection. For their protection. Let's look at verse 11. When Jesus said, and now I am no more in the world, he said, but these are in the world, and I am come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled and so verse 12 here jesus tells us here that he is the one who protected the disciples while he was with them you know he is the one protecting them against satan against uh, every everybody there that was against them um against um the evil that was there present at that time he is the one that is protecting them he was there now he is going back to heaven he's not going to be around anymore and that's why he is asking the father father now that i am going back please protect them protect these guys all right now there's basically two reasons why these disciples needed protection and by the way these 
same two reasons are uh, also applicable to you and me today. Jesus prays for you and for me for our protection because of these two things also. Because this not only applies to the disciples, but also applies to you and me. Let's look at them. The first reason is that the world will hate and persecute these disciples because they have received the word of God. Look at verse 14. He said, I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them. All right, so why do they need protection? Because Jesus gave them the word, the word of God. And this world, if there's something that this world hates, is the word of God. People in the world despise the word of God. They hate the gospel. They hate the Bible. Okay? Um, I mean, you can tell them anything else. You can tell them lies. You can give them empty philosophies. You can come up with all kinds of fables and, 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 and just crazy stuff. And they will eat that up. They will believe it. But you try to talk to them about the Bible and about God's Word and about the Gospel. They will hate you for it. That is just um, the way things are in this world. They despise God's Word. And so Jesus says here, because I have given them thy word, this world is going to hate them. And just like the disciples were hated back in those days, listen, you and I are hated today and we are persecuted and we are rejected because of the very same thing. And so you see how this applies to you and to me today. So again, Jesus is saying, Father, please protect them. Why? First reason, because I gave them your word. And you know, Father, that this world hates your word. The second reason why he's asking for their protection is because the disciples were no longer of this world. Let's look at verse 14 again. I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them because they are not, listen, because they are not of the world even as i am not of the world so that's the second reason they were no longer of the world and listen people can tell that you are different people can tell that you don't belong here christians talk differently christians are supposed to dress differently People, um, Christians, are supposed to act differently. We're supposed to look different, folks. We don't look like the world. We're not supposed to. They should be able to tell that there is a difference between us and them. And when they see that difference, they know that we don't belong in this world. And that right there is a good enough reason for them to persecute Christians. And so Jesus says, look, they are going to be persecuted. They're going to be despised. Why? Because I have given them thy word and because they are going to be different and people are just going to hate them. So please, Father, he says, protect them. Keep them safe. All right, so those are the Two reasons why Jesus is asking for protection. Now, notice that Jesus <clears throat> didn't pray for extraction from the world. Jesus did not pray for extraction from this world. In other words, Jesus is not saying, Father, please take them out of the world. You know that things are going to be very bad for them. Things are not going to go well for them. So please, Father, just, just take him out. He's not praying 
for 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 an extraction. Send an extraction team. Take him out of the world. That's not what he's praying. Uh, again, verse fourteen. <clears throat> I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now notice verse fifteen. I pray not. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. You see, he's not praying so that the Father would take them out of the world, not an extraction from the world. You know, it would be a very strange thing that every time that someone gets saved, that person would just disappear, you know, um, after they're done you know, with, with, with the prayer to receive Jesus Christ, that they would suddenly just disappear, you know, beam me up, Scotty, and then poof, they're gone. That is not what happens, right? No. God leaves us here for a reason. And the reason why Jesus uh, leaves us here and the Father leaves us here is because they want us to make more disciples they use us they use our witness they use our words they use our soul winning they use our door knocking to reach other people so that they also can be converted right that's how i got saved that's how you got saved and that's how people will continue to get saved this is the process so God does not take us out of the world. God leaves us here so that we can talk to others about Jesus Christ. And this Christianity can continue, all right, until Jesus comes back one day. Now, notice something else. Jesus said, in the world, but not of the world. That's important to understand. He said, they are in the world, in verse 11, he said, in the first part, and now he said, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And now notice verse 14 at the end, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And so Jesus says, in the world, but not of the world. And folks, listen. As Christians, we need to have a balance. Because I'm afraid that in Christianity nowadays, we have two extremes. And these are two extremes that God does not like. The first extreme we could call insulation. Insulation. That is, Christians who want to avoid all unbelievers in anything that appears non-Christian in their life. And so these are the Christians that go to a um, <clears throat> Christian restaurant. They only have Christian friends. They want to have a Christian boss. They want to have a Christian job. They live in a Christian town. They drink Christian coffee. And you know what I'm talking about, okay? That would be insulation. They're insulating themselves from the world 100%. God does not want that for us. He, Jesus here is not praying for insulation. Now, there is the other extreme. The other extreme we could call adaptation. Adaptation, that is... Christians will adapt to the world and, and all the worldliness. So these are would be the Christians who would embrace this world. And they will talk like the world. They will dress like the world. They will sing like the world. They will just look like the world pretty soon before they know it they begin to look just like the unbelievers just like the people of this world um, the problem with that is 
if you look like the people of the world, how can you convince them to become Christians and be different when you look just like them? There is a problem, right? I mean, what's the difference if they look just like worldly people? Uh, there is no difference there. So how can you convince them to change? There is no change when you talk like them, when you dress like them, when you act like them, there is no difference there. Very difficult to convert someone like that to Christianity. All right. So that would be adaptation. So there are those two extremes in, in Christianity. I believe that what we need, folks, is a balance. And I think that that's what God wants, a balance. Uh, because Jesus says, we live in the world, but are not of the world. That is, we are in the world, we interact with unbelievers, but listen, we don't become like them. Okay, but we need to spend time with them. Folks, Jesus didn't avoid people. When he was here in his earthly ministry, Jesus did not avoid people of this world. You know what he did? He hung out with them. He spent time with what people would consider sinners and publicans. Mark chapter 2 in verse 14 tells us about this. It says there, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at me in his house, listen, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And verse 16 says, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? This was Jesus. Jesus did not avoid people who were non-religious. No, he went to them. He spoke to them. He spent time with them and I believe that if Jesus was here today you would not just find him in the church Jesus would be out there just hanging out with what you and I would consider sinners you know I think so because his job is to win those people that are godless win them so that they can uh, convert to Christianity so that they can get saved so that they can know God. And I think that that is our responsibility. So we need to have a balance. We need to spend time with unbelievers. But at the same time, we don't become just like them. Jesus did not become a sinner, right? He hung out with them. He spent time with them. But he did not participate in their sins. He was there to talk to them about God so that they can be saved. And that is our responsibility today. You know, someone might say, oh, it's tragic. In my school, I'm the only one that is a Christian. Everyone else, man, they're just, they're not saved. I'm the only one that's a Christian there. And it's terrible. Well, guess what? God has put you in that godless school for a reason. He wants you to be a witness there. He wants you to be light and salt so that people there that don't know God might know God through your witness. You have to bloom where you're planted. And, and, and this is the plan. Of God this is what he wants for you and for me whether you're in in a school that you know there's no other Christians there or maybe in your neighborhood maybe you're the only one that's a Christian maybe in your family 
you're the only one that's a Christian. Maybe um, at, the, at the workplace, maybe you're the only one there that is a follower of Christ. Well, guess what? God expects you there to be a witness so that others can get saved. And so again, we need to have a balance. We need to be light and we need to be salt. So the Bible does teach this balance. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, for example, says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. All right. For those Christians that want to hide from the world, there it is. You cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And then in First John again, uh, chapter 2 and verse 15, here's the other, um, the other uh, side of this coin. Let not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but all but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So you can see then that the Bible teaches this balance. We need to have this balance, all right? Uh, do not practice insulation, all right? But do not practice also adaptation. There is a balance here that Jesus is talking about. Um, so that then again, the first request of Jesus to the Father is for the protection of these disciples. The second request that he makes to the Father, the second request is for their sanctification, for their sanctification. Let's look at verse 17 once again. Verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And then verse 19, For their sakes I sanctify, there it is again, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth and so the second request is for the sanctification of those uh, disciples and by the way god still wants his disciples that is you and me today to be sanctified to be set apart to be holy now notice one thing here the first thing that i see is that Jesus says that the Word of God is truth. The Word of God is truth. In other words, he's saying the Word of God is infallible. The Word of God is inerrant. Infallible means that it's a hundred percent true. There's no falsehood in there. There are no lies. It's 100% reliable and it's 100% true, infallible, inerrant. It means that it's, there's zero errors in the Word of God. Zero errors. Psalm 12 in verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Listen. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified, listen, seven times. In Psalm chapter seven, chapter 19, rather, in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true 
and righteous all together. Again, speaking of Scripture, speaking of the Word of God. It is true. It is 100% reliable. It is infallible and it is inerrant. Jesus said, the Word of God is true and we can trust it and we can depend on it. There is such thing as absolute truth. Jesus says here, the word of God is truth. That means that there is absolute truth. You know, folks, we live in a world that no longer believes that there is such thing as absolute truth. You know, the college professors teach nowadays that truth is relative. You can have your truth, I can have my truth, and they don't have to necessarily agree. You know, the problem is that professors stopped teaching theology a long time ago and started teaching philosophy instead. And so nowadays we have people who actually believe that you can have your truth and I can have my truth and there is no such thing as absolute truth. You can believe whatever you want and that is just fine. People no, long, no longer believe that the Bible is true. But that is a problem. Folks, we need a source that provides absolute truth in our world. We need to have a source. We need to have a moral compass in this world. The Bible gives us uh, an explanation, for example, for the way things work in the moral realm. And we need that in our life. You see, the Bible teaches us that actions have consequences. When you do something wrong, when you sin, there is a consequence uh, that comes from that sin. And I think that that's one of the reasons why people today want to reject the Bible. And that's one of the reasons why people reject the Bible and say, no, truth, you know, is relative and there is no such thing as absolute truth. The, the reason why people say that is because they don't want there to be an ultimate truth. They don't want to be held responsible for their sin. They don't want someone telling them that what they're doing is wrong and that there is consequence for their actions, for what they're doing. They don't want that. And so they reject it. And they say, truth, what is truth? Is there really such thing as truth? Well, Jesus said, there is such thing as absolute truth. And it is the word of God. Now, Jesus again here in this section is praying for the sanctification of the disciples. The sanctification. What does sanctification mean? Sanctification means simply to be set apart for a specific purpose. The vessels, the utensils uh, that were in the temple and in the tabernacle. The Bible says that they were holy. They were sanctified. What does that mean? It means that these utensils, these vessels were set apart for a specific service. They were not to be used for anything else. They were to be used for the service of God. Set apart for God's use. And that is exactly the meaning of the word. When Jesus said, sanctify them, what he meant is, set them apart. There is a specific use, there is a specific purpose now for these men. And that, folks, applies to you and to me today. So Jesus is praying here that they would be set apart for the service of God. <clears throat> now there are three phases, 
three phases or three stages of this sanctification. The first stage is positional sanctification. That happens at the moment of salvation. Positional sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now notice that it's past tense because Paul said, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, and ye are, san ye are sanctified. Past tense, this already happened. This doesn't have to happen. This already happened. What is he talking about? He's talking about a positional sanctification. So but there is a position there. When you get saved, God gives you a position, a place of sanctification. All right? And so that is positional sanctification. The second aspect or the second stage, we could call it progressive sanctification. Progressive it is an ongoing process that involves staying away from sin, from the filth of this world, from worldliness. And this, of course, happens with the help of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. Paul said there, If a man therefore, listen, purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor. Okay? And again, he's alluding here to the vessels and the utensils of the tabernacle or the temple. That were sanctified, notice, unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now, notice the language that he uses. He says, if a man, so that's a conditional statement, if Amen. That is up, something that is up to you and up to me. It is conditional. If a man therefore purge himself from these things, okay, from sin, from the filth of this world, he shall be a vessel unto honor. He's talking here about a progressive sanctification that is actually up to you and up to me. It is conditional. This progressive sanctification is a conditional uh, thing, all right? So, God then gives us a position of sanctification when we first get saved, but the second stage is this progressive sanctification. And finally, number three, we could call it eternal sanctification. Eternal sanctification. This is when we will be perfectly and permanently and eternally set apart without any sin. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27 tells us about this. Paul said here that he, this is Jesus, that Jesus might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be Holy, listen, and without blemish. Now, you know that today, this is not the church. The church today is not without blemish, right? And so, you know that Paul here is talking about the future. This is what Jesus is going to do with the church, with you and with me. One day, he's going to present the church to himself, and in that day, the church, he says, will be holy, will be without blemish. That is not the case um, with our church today, all right? And so this is sometime in the future. This we could call, again, eternal sanctification. So there's positional sanctification, there's progressive sanctification, and there will be eternal sanctification and that is what Jesus is praying for here 
This is the second request that he's making to the Father. Father, please sanctify them. Sanctify them. Now notice that Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. And then he already told us what this truth is. The truth is the word of God, the Bible, right? Sanctify them through thy truth. In other words, sanctify them through your word, through the Bible. Folks, the primary instrument that God uses to sanctify you and me today, while we are still in the world, that primary instrument is His Word, is His Bible. And that is in, that's why it's important for you and for me today to know the Bible, to know God's Word. It is imperative that Christians know their Bible. That is what gives us this progressive sanctification today. John Bunyan said, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And so in closing today, folks, I want to ask you, how close are you to your Bible? How close are you to your Bible? Listen, the closer you are to your Bible, the more sanctified you will be. Remember, it is God's truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this wonderful truths that we learned today. Now, Lord, I ask you, please continue to bless your people. I pray, dear Lord, that you would convince us today of the importance to be in the Word, to know your Word, and to understand your Word, because it is the truth. There is such thing as absolute truth, and it is your Word. Help us, dear Lord, to be close to our Bibles and to know our Bible, to know the Word of God. I pray for everyone that is listening at this time. Bless their lives, dear Lord. And I do ask you all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless you.